Our next speaker is the New York Times bestselling author of The Dueling Neurosurgeons, The Dis Disappearing Spoon, and The Violinist Thumb. His stories have appeared in the best American nature and science writing, The Atlantic Monthly, The New York Times Magazine, Psychology Today, Mental Floss, Slate, and his work has also been featured in, on NPR's Radio Lab, All Things Considered, and Fresh Air. Please welcome to the stage, Sam Keen. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining me this afternoon. So I had a bad go of things in about third grade or so. I came down with strep throat something like a dozen times that year. And every time I did, I got to stay home from school, so it wasn't all bad as far as I was concerned. But each time, I would have to lie down on our couch, and my mother would come in, and she would take my temperature with one of those old-fashioned mercury thermometers, like you can see in the picture here. And I admit I was a little clumsy when I was a kid. I was also kind of prone to talking to myself when no one else was around. So. Whenever my mother would put the thermometer in my mouth and then leave the room, you know, I'd start chatting with myself, you know, doing whatever. And not infrequently, this would happen. The thermometer would fall on our floor and it would break. But I admit I was always kind of secretly excited when that happened because I loved watching the mercury go spilling out of the end of the thermometer. Uh, it was like these little liquid ball bearings just all over our floor. And my mother was actually very cool about the whole thing. You know, she never panicked. She never made us evacuate the house or anything like that. She would actually get down on her hands and knees with a toothpick. And she would brush the little spheres of mercury toward each other. And my favorite part of this was I would be kind of looking over her shoulder, watching her. And my favorite part was when she had two little spheres right next to each other. And she would give them one final nudge, and then they would jump together into this slightly larger sphere that was perfectly seamless. I just thought it was the most gorgeous substance I'd ever seen. I mean, it was a metal, but it was a liquid. It was very shiny, very attractive. It was just amazing, amazing stuff. And, you know, I accidentally uh, broke enough thermometers over the years where we had quite a nice collection of mercury in our house. And my mom would keep it on a little uh, knick-knack shelf. And if we'd been good that day, she'd get it down, let us play with it, things like that. So, you know, we, we, I really had a lot of nice memories of mercury. So when we got introduced to the periodic table for the first time, uh, first thing I did was try to find mercury on there. Looked all over the table, and I just didn't see it. Could not find mercury on there. And of course, mercury is on the periodic table. But the symbol for mercury is HG. Neither of those letters are actually in the word mercury. And I thought, well, boy, that's stupid. Why would that be the symbol if those letters aren't in the word? So then I looked into it a little more and found out that, oh, it comes from some Greek and Latin words. It's very old. And I thought, well, boy, that's interesting. I didn't know they knew about this metal you know, thousands of years ago. And then I looked into it a little more and realized that, oh, wow, interesting. That not only did they know about this metal, but they incorporated it into their culture in a lot of different ways. There was a god, for instance, they associated in some vague way with this metal. There was also a planet that they associated with this. And in fact, there were lots and lots of different things. It had a lot of meaning in their culture besides just the fact that it was a substance. And in fact, it wasn't just the Greeks and the Romans. When I looked into it even more, I found out that, wow, this metal, this mercury, really has a rich and interesting long history beyond that as well. Uh, alchemists were obsessed with mercury. They were always doing experiments involving it. Early scientists used it for lots of different instruments, all their experiments, things like that. When they were colonizing the New World, for instance, they would also ship whole galleons of mercury over to help with gold and silver mining, things like that. And every once in a while, one of them would sink and go into the bottom of the ocean. And I even found out some unusual connections between mercury and American history. Uh, I am actually from the Midwest. I'm from South Dakota. So we always had a very long Lewis and Clark section in our local history classes. But there was one interesting Lewis and Clark story that they did not teach us about in school that actually tied back in with my fascination with mercury. And that story involved 
this man right here, Dr. Benjamin Rush. Uh, he was considered one of the founding fathers of the United States. Uh, he was a physician in Philadelphia, signed the Declaration of Independence, that whole thing. And he was actually best known during his lifetime for staying behind during a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in the 1790s. Uh, a lot of other doctors basically just fled the city, abandoned their patients, but Dr. Rush very bravely stayed behind, treated a lot of people who wouldn't have gotten treatment otherwise. Uh, unfortunately, his pet treatment for pretty much any ailment was this mercury chloride sludge he would feed them. Uh, often until their hair started falling out, their teeth would get loose and fall out, they'd start drooling from the side of their mouths. The idea in medicine at the time was people wanted to know that the medicine was doing something. They wanted to experience a reaction. And mercury really did provoke a reaction in the body. I mean, they knew they were getting their money's worth when they were taking mercury. It's not how we think about medicine nowadays, but that's kind of their reasoning at the time. Uh, but anyway, Dr. Rush thought that these pills were pretty fantastic. He ended up mass producing them, making what were called patent pills. And they were called Dr. Rush's bilious pills. Each was about four times the size of an aspirin, so very large pills. And he packed 600 of these pills with Lewis and Clark when they went wandering through the wilderness. And there's really no delicate way to put it. Uh, but these pills were extremely powerful laxatives. They called them thunderclappers. And, <laughs> and the idea was that if Lewis and Clark or anyone in their party, if they ate something they shouldn't have, drank some questionable water, their stomach wasn't feeling good, they would take one of these pills and it would flush them out, get rid of everything inside their body. And you know, mercury's a poison. Your body doesn't want it in you. That's what's going to happen. And we know that Lewis and Clark and their party used these pills. And in fact, we know that they apparently worked quite well because they've actually had kind of an unusual side benefit for historians and archaeologists in that they can actually still pinpoint a few places where they know Lewis and Clark must have stayed <laughs> because the level of mercury in the soil is just too high for it to have been natural. So from this one element then, from just mercury, I learned about etymology, I learned about word origins, uh, I learned about alchemy, I learned about mythology, poison forensics, some unusual American history, even a little bit of chemistry. And that's really how I got started and interested with science, was learning about these stories about things like mercury and other elements on the periodic table. I just thought it was a really cool collection of different stories about all these elements. And in fact, when I was going through high school, uh, I was completely focused on being a scientist. That's all I wanted to do, just science, science, science. Took all the chemistry, biology, physics that I could. And then I got to college, University of Minnesota, and started studying physics there. And again, I was totally focused on science, science, science. That's all I thought I wanted to do. Till about three years or so into my physics degree when things kind of shifted for me. Uh, because I started working in some professional labs at that time, like actual scientists doing research, not just sort of the cookie cutter labs that you get when you're doing like a physics class, a chemistry course, something like that. Real scientists doing real research. And I got into there and I realized that I just wasn't liking working in the lab nearly as much as I thought I would. Um, different thing, you know, I wasn't always getting like the answers I was supposed to. Things like this were happening. Maybe the thermometer should have been a good hint that I wasn't the best when it came to manipulating lab equipment. But even more than that, I just realized that temperamentally, I wasn't enjoying it nearly as much as I thought I would. I would talk to other people who were working in labs, and they really loved it. They loved like the mystery of it, the problem-solving aspects of it. And something I really didn't think about before I got involved in research is that when you're doing actual real research, you don't always know how an experiment is going to turn out. In fact, that's why you're doing the experiment in the first place. Sounds kind of obvious in retrospect, but again, I'd been kind of going through the whole system of just doing labs and chemistry, physics classes, where I generally knew what was supposed to happen. And when I didn't know what was gonna happen, I just felt really frustrated, didn't like it very much. 
But this introduced another problem for me because now if I wasn't going to be a scientist, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea almost who I was anymore if I wasn't going to be a scientist. So I, I did the only thing I thought I could do. I ran away completely and decided to get an English major on top of my physics major. So I went completely the opposite direction, started writing, reading, doing things like that. And I loved my English major. I really enjoyed it. But at the end of the day, I just missed the science. So what I decided to do was I decided to try to kind of marry the two interests, and I started writing about science. And for me, it was the perfect mix of what I wanted to do. Because I loved science, I just didn't want to be in the lab all the time. What I realized I really enjoyed was telling stories about science, um, stories about great scientists, great discoveries, things, you know, real honest-to-goodness stories with beginnings, middles, ends, characters, all these sorts of things. That's what I really liked about science. And when I thought back about it, that's usually the things that really stuck with me about science, things like, you know, the stories about Mercury that I was learning the whole time. That's what really stuck with me about science, and I decided I wanted to bring that to other people, and I decided science writing was the way to do that. So I started writing um, for some magazines, newspapers. I actually worked at the Post-Dispatch for a little bit in St. Louis one summer before I ended up in Washington, DC. But when I got out there, I realized that what I really wanted to do was write books. I felt like books gave me a little better shot at telling these longer stories, these little more interesting historical stories uh, that I really wanted to tell. So that's where my first book came from, The Disappearing Spoon. And what it basically is, is a collection of stories from the periodic table. There's a funny, a spooky, a weird story about every single element in the periodic table on there. And I did manage to cram all 118 of them in there. It took uh, you know, some finagling a little bit to get them all in there. But I did manage to get them all in there. And really, when I kind of came away from this, what I realized is that the periodic table is maybe the richest source of stories out there in science. You know, people eat and breathe the periodic table. They bet and lose huge sums of money on which elements are going to rise and fall in fortune over time. The periodic table poisons people. It even spawns wars. And overall, I guess, my goal with writing the book, uh, were the, there were two things, actually, I wanted to do. One thing I always remembered from our chemistry classes in high school and college that there were just huge swaths of the periodic table that we never, ever got to talk about. You know, we always talked about the same dozen or so elements, but the other ones we just never mentioned. So I wanted to find out the stories behind those elements. But the other thing I really wanted to do was to show people that there were some really great stories out there about elements that everyone thinks they know really well, but that have kind of an unusual hidden backstory to them. And probably the best example of an element with an unusual hidden backstory is the element aluminum. So we all know aluminum today, obviously. It's in pop cans and baseball bats, things like that. It's kind of a throwaway element. We really don't think much about it. But for a long time, during the 1800s, aluminum was actually the most precious metal on Earth. It was worth far more than silver was. It was worth far more even than gold was. And the reason why is that even though aluminum is very common, it's the most common metal in the Earth's crust, it's always very tightly bonded to another element, oxygen, usually. So for a long time, no one had ever seen a pure sample of aluminum. And when scientists in the 1800s started to make the first pure samples, it was considered kind of a miraculous metal. It was very light, but it was also very strong and very attractive. They considered it a precious metal. And because it was so hard to produce, um, you, all they would get were these little tiny nuggets. That was all they could make at once. Because it was so hard to produce, it actually became something of a status symbol for kings and emperors to get their hands on this metal. Uh, right here, you're looking at an aluminum centerpiece that was created for one of the emperors of France. That's aluminum on the top, and then that's gold going around the bottom beneath it because aluminum was considered the more impressive metal. So you would want to put that on top. Uh, this same emperor, Napoleon III, also had a prized set of aluminum cutlery that he reserved for his most favored guests at banquets. 
and the lesser nobility were reduced to eating with gold knives and forks. It was considered very embarrassing to eat with the gold knives and forks when there was aluminum ones available. And even the United States got into this game a little bit. Uh, where I live now in Washington, D.C., uh, if you've ever seen the Washington Monument, that kind of tall, skinny obelisk down in the National Mall, when the government was erecting this in the 1880s, they decided that they were going to put a six-inch pyramid of aluminum on the very tippity top of the Washington Monument, as you can see in the picture here. And they did that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, if you've ever seen the National Mall or been down there, there is nothing else around the Washington Monument. So lightning was going to strike it at some point. They needed metal up there to act as a lightning rod. But the reason they chose aluminum, of all the metals they could have chosen, was that the US government was bragging a little bit. They were saying, you know, we are such an up and coming industrial power that we can afford to put aluminum, of all things, on our public monuments. Isn't that impressive? And other countries around the world were very impressed by this. Of course, about you know, 10, 15 years later, the US government ended up looking a little ridiculous for this because what happened was the aluminum market crashed completely. A few chemists, one American chemist and a couple of European chemists, finally figured out how to mass produce aluminum on an industrial scale. The American chemist was a man named Charles Hall. He was an undergraduate at Oberlin College in Ohio when he started working on this. And he discovered this process when he was only 23 years old. They called him the Aluminum Boy Wonder after this. And he ended up founding a company, Aluminum Company of America, now known as Alcoa. And no one probably ever made more money more quickly on the periodic table than Charles Hall did. Because when he opened Alcoa, uh, they were shipping out about 50 pounds or so of aluminum per day. And that was plenty to meet demand pretty much nationwide. 20 years later, he was shipping out 20,000 pounds of aluminum every single day, and he could barely keep up with orders. That's how quickly aluminum got integrated into the industrial fabric of not only the US, but around the world. It really quickly became this element that everyone knew about, whereas before, it was something no one really cared about. No one really noticed this element because it was so rare. The only people who knew it were kings and emperors. And I really like that story because, again, it shows you how the fortunes of elements can really rise and fall over time. If people from back then were to get out of a time machine and come see us today, like throwing this element away, they would go diving in our dumpsters, like pulling things out of trash, thinking we were crazy for throwing away millions and millions of dollars worth of this metal. But nowadays, because of the changing science, because of the changing times, it's an element we don't think about. So again, it's kind of an unusual hidden backstory to an element that everyone thinks that they know really well. So again, that was my first book, The Disappearing Spoon. Uh, and then a couple years after that, I got started on a second book. And I really liked the approach of the first book, kind of focusing on stories, really story-based science. But I wanted to move in a little bit of a different direction with that one. So with my next book, The Violinist Thumb, I focused on genetics for that. And again, what I really wanted to do was show people a different side of the science. Show you that, you know, genetics, we all think about genetics in medicine. It's kind of the obvious uh, application of genetics. But really, genetics has overlapped its bounds. And now you can talk about lots of different things with genetics. You can talk about genetics in art. You can talk about genetics in music. You can talk about genetics in computing, genetics in archaeology. All of these different areas, DNA genetic work is kind of colonized. And I wanted to kind of give a broad perspective on what's happening in DNA research nowadays. Um, skip ahead a few slides here, double helix. And, okay. So one thing that genetics really allows us to do that's a lot of fun is kind of retro-diagnose historical celebrities. Um, you can kind of figure out how your favorite historical celebrity died even, which is one of my favorite chapters in the book. Um, and there were even suggestions for fictional characters trying to figure out how they died. Um, you know, I've seen suggestions that Sherlock Holmes had autism, for instance. Uh, someone even published a paper looking at whether Darth Vader might have had multiple personality disorders, something like that. Like you can really get into some wild different areas with this kind of work. But one thing I did want to do 
was kind of, you know, genetics can be a little bit of an intimidating subject, so I wanted to show people that there was a fun side to it as well. And to me, really, I think the most amazing thing about DNA, genes, things like that, is that they work the same basic way. Again, this double helix, it's pretty much universal. It works the same basic way in all known forms of life, in any creature, any plant that you can think of. Whether we're talking about tulips, guinea pigs, toads, toadstools, slime molds, dung beetles, members of Congress, whatever. <laughs> these genes and DNA work the exact same way in all of these bizarre creatures. It's like this unifying thing about life. And I just thought that was fascinating that it brought all of these creatures together. But one thing I noticed, there was kind of a big gap between a couple of different classes of creatures. When it comes to genetics, uh, scientists have kind of set it up, maybe inadvertently, but kind of set it up so that there's human genetics and then there is everything else. And you can especially see that divide when it comes to the names of genes. Because if you ever looked at a paper or maybe a magazine newspaper article that's talking about a human gene, it's usually this very long, complicated word, a lot of jargon in the middle, maybe numbers randomly appearing. They're just really hard words to parse or even get through to read. I mean, they're really awful words. But when it comes to animal gene names, especially other animals, scientists have a little bit more leeway. They can have a little bit more fun when it comes to the names of animal genes. And that's especially true when it comes to the genes of this guy right here, the fruit fly. So he might not look it, maybe not, doesn't look particularly witty, but the fruit fly has probably inspired more creative and unusual gene names than any other animal out there. There are different fruit fly genes named Groucho. There's one called Smurf, Lost in Space, Fear of Intimacy, Tribble, after those multiplying fuzzballs on that famous episode of Star Trek. Uh, there's the faint sausage gene. I have no idea what the faint sausage gene does, but it's a fantastic name. There's the tin man gene. And when the tin man gene gets mutated, fruit flies do not develop a heart. So, kind of makes sense. There's a gene that leaves fruit flies exceptionally tipsy after a tiny, tiny sip of alcohol. It's called the cheap date gene. Probably my favorite gene name, gene name though, uh, doesn't actually come from the fruit fly. It came from the mouse originally. And that gene name was the POK erythroid myeloid ontogenic gene. Now, at a glance, that is a perfect example of a terrible gene name where you basically have no idea what those words are talking about. But if you look a little bit closer, the first three letters are POK, then there's an E at the beginning of the next word, and there's an M with the next word. It kind of spells out Pokemon. <laughs> and in fact, the scientists who discovered this gene, they named it the Pokemon gene. It got published as the Pokemon gene in a scientific paper, and it therefore became the official name of this gene. And everyone had a pretty good laugh about this, uh, except you can see a little R with the circle around it after the word Pokemon there. And it turns out that the lawyers at Pokemon Inc. were not very amused by this whole thing. Because it so happens that the Pokemon gene contributes to the spread of cancer in mice. <laughs> and, and they didn't want their cute little pocket monsters confused with tumors. So they actually threatened to sue the heck out of these scientists. They were really going to take them to the cleaners over this. Finally, the scientists backed down and they gave it some other terrible gene name. But for one shining moment, there was actually a Pokemon gene. So one thing people often want to know is where you get the titles for books. And I thought I would talk a little bit about that with my book, The Violinist Thumb. So the title for this book actually comes from one of the stories in there about a man named Niccolo Paganini. It's a picture of him right here. And if you know anything about Paganini, he's usually considered the greatest violinist who ever lived. He was playing in Europe in the very early 1800s, and every pope, every emperor, every king wanted Paganini to come play for them. He, he, was, the, he was the best there was. 
And in fact, if you've ever heard those stories about musicians who have sold their soul to Satan in order to get their talent, a lot of those stories got started with this guy, with Paganini right here. So they're actually much older than I think a lot of us realize. Uh, but one of the nonfiction, one of the real reasons that Paganini was such a good a violinist was he had these amazing, uh, even kind of freakishly flexible hands. Uh, one thing he could do, for instance, he could take his pinky like this, and he could bend it into a right angle with the rest of his hand just by going like this. It actually gets worse because he could also put his hand down flat on a table like this. He could raise his pinky and his thumb up, and then he could touch his pinky and his thumb behind his hand just by going like this. So he could do things with his hands you should not be able to do with your hands. But it gave him a big advantage when he was playing the violin because he could move his hands in ways that other violinists couldn't. He could stretch them incredibly wide. He never got wrong fingered because his hands were so amazingly flexible. And from a modern perspective, it's almost certain that he had a genetic disorder of some sort. They haven't nailed it down necessarily, but there's a few of them they think that he almost certainly suffered from. Because it wasn't just his hands. He could bend his joints the wrong way, like his knees and his ass. He was like a rubber man in a circus, basically. And again, it gave him this big advantage playing the violin. But I chose it as the title story for the book for a few reasons. Uh, one, I wanted to show this connection between two things you would never think to connect, DNA research and music. Because again, they seem like they're completely different things. One's in the arts, one's in the sciences. But I don't like to think about science as being kind of removed from our everyday life. I like to think about science as informing other areas of human life. And other areas of human life can inform science as well. And I think this is one of those really nice areas where they both come together. When you know about the music and when you know about the DNA research, they kind of reinforce each other. And I think you can get more out of the story if you know a little bit about both sides. But there was another reason why I chose it as the title story as well. Uh, one thing that I've noticed talking about DNA research is that people get a little uncomfortable sometimes. It can be a little uncomfortable talking about genes. Um, they seem like they're a little deterministic, like they sort of rigidly determine who we are. But I think the story of Paganini shows that that's not exactly the case. Because Paganini, he did have these amazing flexible hands, but he was also a very hard worker. And he loved playing and practicing music. And he wasn't in an environment in Europe in the early 1800s that really rewarded this type of work that he was very good at. So it wasn't just his genes that made him who he was. It was his genes, his environment, his temperament, all of those things coming together in one person. It was kind of a perfect storm of traits and environmental inf influences making him probably the best violinist there ever was. I think that's a really important lesson. Because if you talk to geneticists nowadays, they don't talk about nature versus nurture anymore. That's kind of an outdated notion. And it's something I really wanted to emphasize in the book, that it's really nature working with nurture. It's how the two of them work together that make us who we are. And again, that's a really important lesson and something I wanted to reinforce using the title of the book. So that's kind of why I chose it as the title story for the book. So again, that was my second book, The Violinist Thumb. And I wanted to talk a little bit uh, also about my third book called The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeon, so obviously about neuroscience. And one thing people often ask with books is, what inspired you to write this book? Like you could have written hundreds of possible different books. Why did you decide to write this book and not any of those other books? And I can say with this book, what really inspired me was doubt or skepticism, mistrust, whatever you want to call it. Because I was reading a story a few years ago about someone who suffered an injury to one part of his brain, and then his behavior changed in this very unusual way afterward. And I was reading this story, and I just said to myself, you know, that sounds like a bunch of baloney. Like, I do not believe this story. That just, that just sounds a little too strange. So I figured the author had just made a mistake, but I didn't think too much about it, kind of put it aside. Except a few weeks later, I read about something very similar. 
again, a woman this time. She'd gotten injured in one part of her brain. Her behavior changed in this strange way. And I just thought, that, that's bull roar. I thought, there's no way that that can possibly be true. So I set out to try to disprove these stories. And of course, I ended up making myself look a little foolish because I was the one who ended up proving myself wrong. But it was really kind of an, interest, or kind of an inspirational thing to hunt down these stories. So what kind of stories were these? Well, um, I'm sure we've all heard stories about people who've gotten injured in one part of their brain and lost uh, you know, movement on one side of their body or their memory disappeared, things like that. So it wouldn't have been something like that that would have startled me. What really surprised me was how specific these people's deficits were. For instance, I think uh, all, all of us in here can generally recognize what types of animals these are, even if we don't know exact species. You know, there's a monkey, there's a bird, there's a cat with a frog thing on it for some reason. Like, we all generally know what kind of animals these are. But it just so happens that if you get nicked in one spot in the temporal lobe, which is on the side of the brain, right behind the temple, if you get nicked in one spot in the temporal lobe, all knowledge of animals can disappear out of your mind. So these people can tell plants apart, no problem at all. They can tell human-made objects apart. They can tell individuals, people's faces apart. But dogs, raccoons, elephants, lizards, whatever, all of these animals look exactly the same to them. They simply cannot tell these creatures apart suddenly after this injury. Or sort of the opposite thing can happen where someone might get injured in a slightly different spot, and they'll be able to tell animals apart, no problem, but all knowledge of plants will just disappear out of their mind, and suddenly they cannot tell plants apart. And I thought, boy, that's really weird. Why would that happen in the brain? But when, it kind of made sense when I looked into it, because what the scientists argued was that, well, think about our ancestors way, way back when, when they were out in the savanna, out hunting, gathering plants, things like that. There were certain people who were very good at recognizing and classifying different types of animals. They could say, okay, this animal is good to eat. We should hunt those. This animal's dangerous. Stay away from those. This animal's a good companion. We should, you know, spend time with this animal. Same with plants. Some people said, okay, these plants are very good as medicines. These plants are poisonous. Don't eat them. These plants are very good to eat. Things like that. So there were just some people who were better at recognizing and classifying different types of animals and plants. Those people ended up having an advantage evolutionarily, and eventually this ability to recognize plants and animals ended up kind of hardwired into the human brain. It just seems to be an ability that human beings pick up very quickly, very naturally. We're very good at taxonomy, basically, telling different animals and plants apart. But the downside of having this specialized circuitry in the brain is that if those circuits get injured, then poof, that knowledge can just kind of disappear out of your mind. And I thought, boy, that's really cool. Like, it gives an interesting insight into the way the brain works, just knowing about this little injury. And the second story uh, that I mentioned I thought was even crazier. Uh, again, we've probably all heard stories about people who've been injured, had a stroke or something, and lost the ability to speak or something like that. And the area highlighted in Peach there is one of the areas involved in language production called Broca's area inside the brain. And if you get a stroke to that part or damage to that part, you're probably going to lose the ability to speak. Uh, sometimes, though, something a little different happens. Because if you think about it, the Broca's area is inside the brain. The mouth is the thing actually producing speech. So that information has to get from the brain to the mouth somehow. The way the body does this is through neurons, nerve wires. Basically, we have these biological wires that send information from the brain down to the mouth. And sometimes what happens in some people is that the Broca's area, the language production area itself, is OK. But the wires connecting the language part to the mouth get damaged. The wires end up broken because of a stroke or whatever. And in these people, again, they can't speak because the, the information simply can't get from the brain to the mouth. But one thing you notice when you start studying neuroscience is that there's a lot of back alleys in the brain. There's a lot of alternative routes, other ways to send information. So if it can't get there directly, the information can get there sometimes indirectly. 
For instance, there happens to be a connection between the Broca's area, the emotional centers in the brain, and then the emotional centers can get in touch with the teeth, the tongue, and the lips. And what happens with these people is if you're trying to have a conversation with them, they just can't get the words out. It's very frustrating for them. They just can't get the conversation going. But if you provoke these people, if you rile them up, if you get their emotions engaged, they can swear at you no problem at all. They'll say, you beepity beep beep, and then sort of jump back and cover their mouth because in a lot of cases, they didn't even realize they could say these words. It just bubbled up out of the emotional, unconscious parts of their brain. Uh, something similar can happen uh, because there are connections between the language centers, the musical centers of the brain, and then the musical centers can get in touch with the teeth, the tongue, and the lips. And what happens with these people is that they, again, can't have conversations, but they can sing song lyrics no problem at all. In fact, if you remember a few years ago, the congresswoman from Arizona, Gabrielle Giffords, she got shot in the head while she was giving a speech, and she lost the ability to speak after that because of where the bullet went inside her brain. But it turns out that when she went to rehab, she could still sing. She was singing songs like, Girls Just Want to Have Fun in Rehab. And I don't know why Cindy Lauper, out of all the possible songs, kind of stuck in her head. But by practicing singing, she was able to teach herself how to speak again. So this really had an amazing impact on her life, this ability to sing even though she couldn't speak. And it's actually not that uncommon. It's a well-recognized symptom, not being able to speak, but being able to sing. And I was kind of thinking one day, like, wow, this is really fascinating. Like, I bet you could write a whole history of how the brain evolves, how it works, things like that, just based on different injuries and what it teaches us about how those parts of the brain work. And then kind of the cartoon light bulb went off over my own brain, and I said, boy, you know, I should write a book like that. Like, that would be a lot of fun. So that's basically where my book came from, The Dueling Neurosurgeons, was it looks at famous case studies, people being injured, people with different types of brains, things like that, and just talks about what we know based on different types of brains, when one, parts of the brain, one part of the brain goes down, how their behavior changes, different things like that. And I thought I would wrap up the talk with a quick story about one case, one example. And this isn't a case of an injury. It's a case of an unusual brain structure, basically. And it's really an example. Well, I'll just go into the story, I guess. So this story gets in, started in, uh, outside of Vancouver in about the year 2005. There was a woman there. Uh, who found out she was pregnant, found out she was going to have twins, actually. So she was kind of excited. But when she got to one of the later sonograms, the doctor said, I'm sorry, I have some bad news. Your twins are actually conjoined, what used to be called Siamese twins. So they were fused together inside her. And she thought about it, and she said, well, you know, I want to have these kids. And so she decided she was going to bring them to term. And as you can see in the picture here, the children are actually joined at the head. They have a Siamese brain. And I should emphasize that both girls are still alive today. They're happy, they're healthy, they're in school, they have, seem to have normal intelligence. So the story turned out about as well as it could have given, you know, this, it could be very dangerous to have conjoined twins, but this story turned out fairly well for these girls. But because of their Siamese brain, they show some unusual behavior. Specifically, the part of their brain that is connected is a part called the thalamus. And the thalamus is part of the limbic system inside the brain. And what the thalamus does is it basically relays sensory information. So information from your eyes, from your ears, from your mouth. It gets sent into the brain, into the thalamus. And the thalamus is a relay center. So it sends some of the information here for processing, some there, some there for processing. Again, it's a relay center. But because these girls, Krista and Tatiana, share a thalamus, they share a lot of sensory information on some level. So well, what does that mean, they share sensory information? Well, it turns out that if one of the girls is taking a sip on a cup of juice, the other girl can actually taste the juice in her mouth. Or you give one of the girls a shot at the doctor's office, the other one grabs her arm in pain. 
You tickle one of them, the other one starts to laugh. They fall asleep together. They maybe even dream together. And scientists have never seen anything like this before. This is really, really incredible. And the girls are still pretty young. They're only about 10 years old or so now. So they haven't done a lot of extensive work on it. But it has opened up some really interesting, really profound questions about the nature of the brain, consciousness, personal identity, things like that. And to me, kind of the big question, I think the biggest question is one about personal identity. Because if they're sharing this sensory information, they're kind of sharing their consciousness on some level. I mean, they're aware of the exact same things at the exact same time going on around them. So I think the obvious question is, well, are they two individual people, or is it kind of one person? And the answer is a little ambiguous, but I think overall it points to them being two individual people uh, for a few reasons. One. Um, the girls have a habit, apparently, of walking up to people sometimes, and one of them will say something like, I am just me. Now, it's kind of a strange thing to say. Like, no one here would walk up to somebody and say that. It seems kind of obvious. But it turns out these girls have apparently this instinct to kind of define themselves as individual people. And there are a few anecdotes out there as well uh, that kind of show, again, this instinct to define themselves as individuals. Uh, one thing that uh, is kind of unusual is that one of the girls likes ketchup. You know, she loves ketchup on her hot dogs, her french fries, whatever. Uh, unfortunately, her sister hates ketchup and ends up scraping her tongue whenever her sister eats it because she can taste the ketchup in her own mouth. And it, kind of the opposite thing happens. The other girl likes canned corn. You know, she loves canned corn. Unfortunately, her sister is allergic to canned corn and breaks out in hives whenever this happened. And you know, it's kind of these amusing-ish anecdotes, but it really does show that the girls are individuals because they're getting nearly identical sensory input, but they're responding to it in very different ways. So it shows that their brains are processing it a little bit differently, even though they have this one connection in there. So I think if you look at the bulk of the evidence, it will show that they are these individual people, even though they're sharing this brain. So that's kind of what I wanted to do with the book, was not only look at these different injuries and things to talk about what we can learn about the brain, but to look at how neuroscience is really able to get, in some cases, at least a little bit of traction on these big questions nowadays about consciousness, personal identity, memory, these really big things. We are starting to make a little bit of progress on it. And I think I will actually wrap the talk up right there. Um, but again, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my books, and especially because of where I came from. When I thought I was really going to be a scientist all those years, I thought that was the only way I could really contribute to the world of science was by making discoveries. But I found out that there were other ways to contribute too. And I don't think the kind of storytelling that I do nowadays is really any less important, not only for getting things out there to people who aren't scientists, but to scientists themselves, really helping them understand where their work fits into the larger scheme and what it really means to do science nowadays. So again, thank you everyone for coming.